Hello and welcome to the show, Paranormal Fact or Fiction, the only paranormal show anywhere in the world where we discern between the urban myth and myths, the truth and scare, the history and the mystery. My name's Wesley Johnson. Every week, I'm gonna pick a haunted location. I'm gonna recall all the stories and information that the internet has to offer. And we're gonna determine if it's fact or fiction. I will then use my own historical research on all of the buildings, plus my own paranormal investigations with my team, the International Paranormal Society, to see if what we come up with is cool or ball. To help us on this endeavor and on our journey, we have the bunk bell. So if Wesley comes up with anything, I told you not to touch that. If Wesley <laughs> comes up with anything that is bunk, we shall ring the bell and we are keeping score and we shall see at the end what is fact and what is fiction. So what property have we got to look at today? This week, we are gonna talk about a location that's near and dear to both of our hearts, mm -hmm. a place that us, along with many people, are familiar with, the Soap Factory. The infamous and famous Soap Factory. There we have it. So let's see what we can uh, tear apart. Let's see if the internet's gonna win or not. Uh, so far, I have to say that the fact hasn't won. The internet has won. That is true. So uh, we need to true. get back on track with this. We need more rubbish. That's yes. What we need. We, we, we that, have that plenty a, of that. Is that the proper term? I'm sure we could fill half an hour of rubbish. That is the <laughs> correct term, sir. Well, let's get started. So uh, this is kind of my, my favorite opening as far as tidbits that I have found. And it says, if the Palmer House is the most famous haunted site in Minnesota, then the Soap Factory, which is a cavernous 1883 warehouse on the Minneapolis Riverfront, once experimental art venue, once an experimental art venue, already calling them apart here, uh, is apparently the fiercest. <laughs> You're bunking your own stories. <laughs> How does that, that's like suicide, surely. It, uh, yeah, poor English. Well, I'm gonna bunk that again because I think it's 1884 and not 1883. I believe you. I'm happy to stand corrected in these orthopedic shoes, but we shall find out. I think that's 84 okay. and not 83. We're gonna, for the sake of uh, you know, giving people what they want, sure. we're gonna we're gonna go with that. I'm determined to push bunk ahead this like time that. round. Yeah, Th I think that's good. So you think 1884, not 1883? What would you say in terms of your own experience, though, as being the fiercest? We'll get onto that. Fiercest in terms of how much activity or how strong that activity is, or whether you're feeling threatened. I wonder why it said the Palmer House was the most famous haunted location in Minnesota. I would disagree with that. I yeah. think there's others that have more activity. Right. Uh, certainly there's more going on. Perhaps that's the one that has the best marketing mm -hmm. and has the most amount of TV shows attached to it. I'm gonna be controversial. I will say to you that the corner drugstore opposite the Palmer House is more haunted in my opinion due to the hundreds of investigations I've done in that town than the Palmer House. But it's interesting that crossroads yeah. should create so much energy. It right. is a very cavernous building. There is a lot of activity there. Uh, it's probably the most dangerous building I've ever investigated. Yeah. I wonder if in the past I've said during an interview, this is the most dangerous building I've ever investigated in. And due to how people write things and report things, they may have written down it's the fiercest. But dangerous because it's an old abandoned, yeah. disused factory. I will tell you a good piece of advice for ghost hunting. If you're doing uh, an investigation in a building, make sure you do a walkthrough in the daylight before right. you go in there, because I'm very glad I did that at the soap factory. There was an occasion on the third and top floor that I was walking through the building doing a walkthrough. And due to the fact it's so cavernous, I want to do as much research as possible yeah. because I've only got a limited amount of time there. I think I investigated twice in this factory in the same year back in the day. I think we were the first to investigate that, but if you walk through the building, there's holes in the floor. I opened one door and I went to walk in and all the floors had collapsed and I was about to step into the basement, but from the third <laughs> floor. Now you imagine it's pitch dark yeah. and you've only got a flashlight. So this is why we need to do walkthroughs in the daylight. And also I want to see in such a vast cavernous building, I want to see where's the best places that we're gonna get the most activity because we're a limited number of us. Yeah. And obviously it's such a large, building, but I wonder if in the past, I'm gonna bunk that again, because I want you to write that up. I wouldn't say it's the fiercest, but it's the most dangerous, because it was basically an abandoned warehouse with holes in the floor. Everywhere you were walking, there was elements of danger, there was loose wiring. Um, I think if I'd have investigated that building without doing the walkthrough in the daylight, 
um, we may have had some sort of industrial incident or accident. So not the most fiercest, the most dangerous, but due to building physical. regulations, physical yeah. danger of actually uh, coming a cropper, as we say in Britain, yeah. due to loose floors and holes and, and all the things a disused warehouse and factory would bring you and present to you, mm -hmm. for sure. I accept that. Let's talk a little bit about the history, and I think maybe part of it, part of the fierce term can maybe come from that. Naturally, it was a soap factory. It was. We can, we can ascertain that much. That was a soap factory, yes, but yeah. that's the last thing it was. It was only a soap factory from about 1924 onwards. Uh, the, the Left Green family actually had that factory as the National Purity Soap Factory from 1924 onwards. And obviously, if that building was built in 1884, it's had a history before it even got to that point. Originally, it was built, if you know where the location is, it's the last unconverted warehouse on the banks of the Mississippi in the whole of Minneapolis. And it's next to the Pillsbury A Dough Factory. And I'm sure as a Minnesotan, you know exactly where that is. Yeah. So it was an important building historically that it hadn't been changed, but it was owned by the railway. If you recall that building, there's actually a railway track behind that before it reaches the Mississippi. So it was actually owned by the National Railway Company and they used it originally. It was a one-story building. They used it originally for storing cement, lime, building supplies. Then it was bought by a company called the Grant Battery Company, and they store batteries there. This isn't exciting, is it? This doesn't make good yeah, yeah, it's television, but we're, we're <laughs> creeping towards the interesting yeah, we'll stuff. We'll get to the good stuff. So railway storage, <laughs> battery storage. Uh, then a company bought it that was making jelly and peanut butter. In 1917, a lot of Americans were going to the First World War, and they discovered that a good way to feed and keep the troops happy in France and over in Europe during the First World War, uh, they invented grape jelly. And it was easy to manufacture, it was cheap to send over, it didn't go off. Well, when people came back from the First World War, they had a taste for grape jelly and everyone wanted grape jelly. There was an explosion of grape jelly production, so it was a jelly company. The great age of That's grape right. jelly. Yes, it was the golden age of jelly. I'm a fan. Do you know I've never had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? I just thought I'd share that with you. I think I have to quit. I don't know what to say. I mean, I'm sure I've had my <laughs> fair share of fish and chips and, and pie and mash, but I've never had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But they made peanut butter and jelly. Then they discovered, rather intelligently, that germs and bacteria actually caused, you know, by dirt and, and not being clean. So as you know, Minnesota, huge area for dairy farming. Suddenly soap production just exploded. And in 1924, it was taken over as a soap production. There was a factory there. Minnesota and Minneapolis was the center of soap production all over the world. They produced more soap in Minneapolis and Minnesota than anywhere else in the world because the ships could come straight in from Lake Superior, they can go up the Mississippi. They had all the chemicals they needed from Europe. They had a fresh water supply from the Mississippi. So there is a pipe that goes from the factory to the Mississippi and they had everything they needed in house. But Minneapolis was the capital of soap production at the turn of the last century. <laughs> You're looking like astounded Every, by that. We, we're, there's no shortage of things we're gonna learn, paranormal or not. Well, I'm gonna tell program. you what, we're in a parlor right now. We are. This is laid out for a wake and we've dressed appropriately. <laughs> well, one of us has dressed one of appropriately. Us has. You're wearing- I'm, I'm matching. Yes, we, we did color coordinate rather, <laughs> rather bizarrely. Um, we're, in a, we're in a parlor, ultimately. What they discovered in the Victorian period is that germology and bacteria isn't a good thing to have around. So in a parlor like this, in a wake, they would have had bodies laid out for a week or two in the Minnesotan sun. They discovered it wasn't a good idea to be eating your dinner whilst Auntie Barbara's laid out in a <laughs> coffin, right? Yeah. So to try and get the dead people from the parlor into the funeral homes, they built purpose-built buildings around town that you could hand the body over to. Yeah. Nobody wanted to do that. You know, your mother, your grandmother, they've built that house, they've lived in that house, they don't want to hand the body over to strangers in a strange building no one's ever been to before. Mm. So to make that transition easier, to make that fracture, that sever a little easier, they then called them funeral parlours and funeral homes to try and make that less problematic. And bit by bit, the Victorians took their dead bodies out of the house where you were eating your dinner and put them in the funeral homes and the funeral parlours, but we don't use the word parlour anymore. 
That's not a no. word we use. That's your grandmother's yeah. words, your grandmother's vernacular. We don't call this the parlor anymore. We call it the living room because it's now the room for the living because the dead have been removed. I, I just love etymology and the history yeah, of words. That sounds like a book. Well, Unless you, if, you, if you haven't written it already. Um, I've got six or seven books up here that I need to write, so I hope I don't die anytime soon. It would be a huge disappointment to me. And me. But, you know, yeah. with the soap factory, it's the same thing. They've discovered germology, bacteria. There's suddenly an explosion during this period of history for soap production. So this is where we find ourselves. Okay. Well, let's get to the uh, let's get to some of the activity now. Sure. One thing about the soap factory or soap manufacturing in general, uh, it was made from animal fat. So that is true. There are some claims here that all of the animal fat or animal death, if you will, uh, as well as a separate note, uh, lots of stray dogs that would find themselves in the factory who were slain by strangulation or other means. Well, you're strangling dogs, right? Uh, according to this, lots of dogs were strangled. I'm no expert on dogs, but I'm under the impression if you were to strangle a dog, it would put up a fight and that would be fairly unpleasant. They don't like being strangled, <laughs> Just do a they? little bit. Right, so first of all, there is some truth in that because obviously you're 100% correct and you can give yourself a point there. Soap production and the fat and the lye is made from animal carcasses. Yeah. They're not strangling dogs on <laughs> sight. I'm not quite sure where that comes from. But at the turn of the last century in Minneapolis, there were 35,000 stray dogs. This was a huge problem, yeah. a huge epidemic of stray dogs. And the local government in Minneapolis said, if you find a dog and it's a stray, we will give you a dollar which was the worst thing that could have happened because every vagrant, every unemployed person, everyone who wants a fast buck would then go out, find a dog and try and claim their dollar. So if you left your little dog Fifi tethered in your front <laughs> yard, you would go out an hour later and there'd just be a lead there. Fifi! And, uh, well, a week later, you, you could enjoy a nice bath or a shower with her at that point. So they had to put in place some sort of regulation where you'd have a little tin badge. Was it because she was turned into soap? Is that's that the correct, sir, you're that's making? right. I'm glad okay. you're catching yeah. up with me. I'm with you. Um, but you'd have a little tin badge that said dog catcher on it. Like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, you know, you had the child catcher. <laughs> there was now a dog catcher and he would wander around with a net and they just wanted to get that number of dogs off the streets. Now, it was very profitable because you would get your dollar for your stray dog, but then you would send, rather disappointingly for animal lovers, you would send the fur to the tannery and you would send the carcass to the soap factory. So the soap factory did process stray cats, stray dogs and dead horses no strangling of animals would have taken place on they the premises. They weren't blatantly murdering the this dogs. This is 1924. <laughs> we have electricity and modernity and, you know, swing and everything else. We weren't strangling <laughs> dogs to make soap. But ultimately, uh, there was a ready-made supply of product available to them via the dogs that ran straight in Minneapolis at that time. <laughs> 100% true. Who would have known Who all knew? this information about the soap factory? I'm just glad, I, like you know. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we... So, so far, the bunking is winning this round. Yes. I'll have you for the, the, the first episode. How many weeks have we been doing it now? Too many. The bunks <laughs> are winning. Here's another fun one. We'll just get the bunks out of the way, uh -huh. shall we? Okay. So, according to this source, there are no known suicides or homicides happening on the premises. Many are skeptical considering making soap involves a ton of animal carcasses which could easily have hidden a human body or two. They felt the need to write that in there. Um, what are your thoughts on Again, that? 1924 onwards, I mean, this isn't the medieval period. <laughs> you know, and if a gangster wanted to dispose of a body, that seems a long process where you could be found. It's a giant factory. There's lots of people working there. I'm sure you'd notice a dead body go by when the Mississippi is no more than 50 yards away. Seems an odd risk yeah. to take. I would not think that any And, and they don't necessarily claim that that happened. They're just saying people think, but we can, it's get, we'll give it a bunk. Bunkage we'll give it a bunk. is where we are. Give no, it a bunk. No dead bodies were processed at the soap factory. It would be far too dangerous. Again, this is 1924. This isn't the medieval period. They had plenty of product, plenty of carcasses to work with. Mm. I will tell you, it's a really miserable pit of a building. Everything's covered in grease. So when I'm doing the investigation, I've already told you there's holes in the floor, there's stairs missing, it's very dangerous. You go to grab hold of a hand rail and everything's got this really thick grease cake to it. Mm -hmm. There's stalactites 
hanging from the ceiling of fat, and you know that's dog carcass fat. So it has a really grim kind of feel to it. You want to scrub yourself when you leave, you know, due to With the soap. way. With How soap. ironic is that? <laughs> Give yourself a point, <laughs> sir. It's unlike you that's to, what, be, that's for to me. be funny. I'm witty. You are indeed, sir. <laughs> Um, the other thing I would add to that is a really dangerous process. I don't know if there was industrial accidents or not, but I've been in the furnace room where they put the heat above mm. the vats on the next floor. So who's got the best job? The guy shoveling lung busting coals into the furnace in the darkness, you know, in a hundred degree heat, or the guy upstairs who's having to deal with throwing dog carcasses into boiling fat. And there were stations around the building for eye washing and burns and showers and various things like that. So I'm sure that happened. I don't have any historical data that says there were any deaths or industrial accidents at the soap factory, but the Schmidt Brewery next door, I have a list of industrial incidents, accidents, people being overcome by fumes in the vats and dying. Uh, one gentleman set himself on fire by accident with oil from the lamps. So there have been industrial accidents and a soap factory around that period in Minneapolis did explode. Okay. Um, so there has been incidents and accidents. I have no historical research on whether any of that happened at the National Purity Soap Factory. But clearly your experiences there have you, or have had you pretty shaken, right? And I, I have a reason for asking. I've never been scared, but I've been concerned. And there is a subtle difference between the two. I've been concerned where I think to myself, what's gonna happen next? What happens if this takes place? How do I protect my team? There's been moments of concern. I've never been scared. I've been more afraid of the living than I am of the dead. Well, I find that very interesting. I'm gonna tell you why, because yes. they have you quoted a nice. couple different spots, and one, considering this place, simply demonic. <laughs> Those just don't sound like words that I would hear you saying seriously, but I, I, um, demonic? No, I wouldn't say. Oh, somebody's misquoted me, or that's been taken <laughs> out of context. Or too much to drink. Well, there is a lot of things in there that are negative. When you walk in, you feel sick to the pit of your stomach. It is a nasty building. Obviously, thousands and thousands and thousands of animals were processed there. I, I'm not suggesting they were killed there. I don't think that happened on site, but that does take place. There is a residual energy, yeah. but then you've got to factor in the floors missing, the grease yeah. everywhere. It's just an unpleasant building, full stop. But I have had a lot of activity there. There was one incident where I was in the furnace room and again, you think about the guy shoveling in the coals, it was pitch black. I felt as if there was a ghost walking by me. I do have psychic skills and I felt that happen. So I set a camera up and I put a tripod in the corner of the room and it's important to put it in the corner as a paranormal investigator because you don't want people walking behind it. You don't want anything to go behind the camera. So if you push the tripod into the corner, it stops any interference and you're having better evidence. Yeah. And I had a cable release and it's so dark in there, I press the shutter and you've got a 20 second exposure just to pick everything up. So the camera's seeing more than I can see with my actual eye because mm -hmm. I'm exposing it for a longer period of time. Yeah. So the room's pitch black. I felt a ghost walk past me. I pressed the shutter. And then when I saw the picture I'd taken with a digital camera, I saw a white ghostly figure walking past the camera, almost like it's blurred, where he you're catching his movement. And that's one of the photographs in the book, Mysterious Minnesota. So I have taken a photograph of a ghost. This is your cue, sir. Mysterious Minnesota. I've read it twice, I can highly recommend it. And there is a picture in there of the ghost I caught at the soap factory. I would go as far as to say that's the best photograph of a ghost I've ever taken anywhere in the world. You're gonna try and find that now. But not aren't to show you? people. Now that you know what, they're gonna to have to get the book. They are. Perfect. If you wanna see this photograph, you get the book. What did I warn you about touching the bell by the hey, way? Hey, it was for it was for your own benefit, but this leads well, me to Well I did let it go, didn't I, to be fair. <laughs> so we got we got a bunk there, but I'm gonna have you hold off here because this sure. brings us to another uh, apparently they also have you quote saying that there's no way you'll ever go in there without the help of a couple pastors. Because Not one, a couple pastors. One, one pastor's never enough, is you have to double up. Yeah. I actually have a background <laughs> in this as well. I'm actually an ordained minister, so there would be three of us at that point. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> they only used two for the exorcist. Yeah. So why are we suddenly needing three? I think... Haunted fat. I vaguely remember saying this on a radio show many years ago, but it was a joke. 
With my accent and the way I present myself, mm. if I tell a joke, some people don't get it as a joke. We don't understand humor in this country very well, so, unless it's our own. Yes, this is very true. So at that point, I think I may have said something like, oh, I wouldn't go in there unless there was two pastors with me. It was, it, I think it was a throwaway <laughs> kind of joke. Yeah. And it's been quoted as being gospel truth. The press ran with it. I'm happy. Or made for good headlines. Well, it, it does exactly both. I, I'm happy to walk through the gates of Hades and I don't think I'll get scorched uh, with the things that I have with me, including my religion and so forth. One day I may get my ass kicked and we'll find <laughs> that not to be true. But... There is a lot of nasty things in there. There is shadow figures. There's uh, the barking of dogs I've recorded. There was an incident where I heard what sounded like a wrench being thrown down the elevator shaft and you could hear it knocking all the way down. And we were the only people in the building. And I will let you into an insight. When I write my books, people tell me that they hear my British accent almost like I'm reading it to them. Yeah. Which I applaud. I think you're <laughs> winning as an author if they can hear the author's voice. Yeah. When we go through the books and they're being proofread, my editor and my proofreader and the publisher say to me, do we want to leave the Britishisms in or do we want to change them? And we have a conversation and we go through the book and we look to keep in the things that are British and the things that we might want to change. That sentence a wrench being thrown down an elevator shaft was one of the few occasions I've had to make a change. Because originally I wrote that and said it sounded like a spanner going down a lift shaft. And they said, no <laughs> one's gonna oh, understand what? that. So that is one of the few sentences in this book that got Americanized on the back of that. But that was one of the incidents from there as well. Well, I think pertaining to these quotes, I think we got a we got a couple bunks there. I think a couple. I think we can squeeze yeah, two out yeah. of that. The, 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 the bunks are running amok at this point. Two for the price of one, sir. Yeah, yeah. Investigation of the space has found men and women. I don't, they don't, they don't include women in that, but I'm gonna go ahead and put that in there. Men and women getting attacked, a darkness so profound it blotted out infrared imagery. Uh, and perhaps most disturbingly, the smell of sulfur. And I, I remember when I have been in there, right. I, have, I do remember the smell of sulfur. Uh, I don't know if I'd call that the most disturbingly, but based off the information you're giving, I could see how that would probably oh. stack up as the most haunted. Or, or the smell of 100-year-old rotting dog fat is yeah. probably where yeah. um, that is. Read the first part of that again when you said men and women. So, the... so investigations of the space have found men Again, whoever's writing these, you know, probably don't have a degree in writing, but uh, it's found men and women getting attacked. Yeah, I've never found that to be the case. Yeah. I will say to you, thermal imaging cameras work through energy, it's radiation. So the fact that it's dark and light makes no odds to a thermal imaging camera. It's measuring radiation, isn't yeah. it? And so um, dark and light makes no odds to a thermal imaging camera. Yeah. I have experience when I think darkness has arrived or something negative yeah. has arrived. And they don't specify really what sure. they mean here, but I'm, I'm taking it as you're, how you're taking it. Right. Yeah. I have been in situations where I think something biblically evil may have arrived, and that's so few and far between. It's only happened a couple of times in my career, yeah. and I've spent every weekend in a haunted building somewhere in the world. But it does feel like it's suddenly got a lot darker, like someone's thrown an army blanket over everything. You think it's dark, and suddenly it gets so much darker. Mm -hmm. And the smell of sulfur does exist. Yeah. Uh, you do get that feeling, but then you get snuffling noises, animalistic noises, you get a feeling in the pit of your stomach. Yeah. So they're getting the information right, but I wouldn't have applied that necessarily um, to the soap factory. Yeah. It's a fairly innocuous building, and all they're doing is processing soap. The only thing that's dark about that is they're using animal carcasses, yeah. but they're not killed on site, so it'd be no difference from a sausage factory, I guess, or a pork processing plant, perhaps. Yeah. It wasn't an abattoir. Um, as well. One of the interesting things for me on the investigations I did there is I've lived in other countries and I can speak a few other languages to a reasonable level. One of the best EVPs I've ever received was in the soap factory. I was asking the usual questions about who's there and what's taking place and I got an EVP that was in Italian. It said Bella Luci. And that means beautiful light. And obviously you can translate that to going towards the light or seeing the light. And uh, in Minneapolis, and of course the whole of America, especially Chicago and New York, after the First World War, one in five Italians 
came to America and emigrated. Can you believe one in five of a country came over to America? So you know there's a big Italian population yeah. in New York. There's a big Italian population in Chicago. I actually had Italian EVPs coming through in the soap factory where I guess they would have employed an Italian workforce back in the same period of history yeah. in the mid 1920s where so many people were emigrating from Italy after the First World War. And it's always been a problem for me that when you do investigations in other countries, you get EVPs coming through. You may have seen the TV shows where they're in Transylvania and Romania, you know, listening for Dracula and it's all coming through in English when it would be ancient Romanian. And in my experience of doing investigations all over the world, I've spoken to spirits in French. I've spoken to them in German. The Palmer House, I had a conversation with a maid there in German. Um, so they will give you EVPs and they will talk to you in the language that's their native language. As a psychic, of course, language is irrelevant because if the Italian gentleman thought of a cat, I will think of a cat. A cat is a cat mm -hmm. in terms of your thinking. It just yep. has a different... Name. So that was a very interesting EVP from the Soap Factory and one of my favourites. And again, there's nothing dark and demonic about that. He just happened to be Italian. Right. So I just made sure that my wallet was safe and we were good. Everything <laughs> was perfect. Let's, uh, we got one more piece of history. We'll yep. start to kind of wrap it up. But I suppose, so uh, we, we've fallen on the bunk on that as far as... I'm happy to ring the bell. This makes me happy. It's the small things in life, isn't it? Do you find that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, one more little bit of history here. Um, so according to this source, before the warehouse was built, the site was home to a small business that produced artificial limbs for soldiers wounded in the Civil War. Bunk. Damn it! That was actually that one I wanted to be true. That's kind, of a, that's kind of a cool fact, but no. Nope. There was a gentleman that lost his leg during the Civil War, and of course the invention of the mini ball which was a nasty piece of artillery that span meant that many people during the Civil War lost limbs because it would just shatter bones and destroy anything it came into contact with. He lost a leg. He lived in Minneapolis. He came back from the Civil War and he was a blacksmith and he made himself an artificial leg. Due to yeah. the fact there were so many amputees during the Civil War, he did actually start a business, but it was two blocks away from there. So okay. he did have an artificial limb business and people from all over the Midwest would come to get artificial limbs fitted, but it wasn't... But not on this location. Not on that location. It's in the same district. Yeah. So I can, you know, if you're looking at urban myths, I can see how that could be confusing. Yeah. But he wasn't on that site. He was in a different building a couple okay. of blocks away. Well, the last bit we have here, which I think is what probably most people know the uh, soap factory for, and, and certainly probably has something to do with some of these myths that have found their way into the mainstream media. It's a popular haunt. It has been for quite a few years. Yes. They do a Halloween experience there, don't they? It's one of the best yeah. in Minneapolis. If you want to go for an evening and be chased around by an unemployed drama student with a broken chainsaw, that is the place yeah. to be. One of the investigations I did at the soap factory, we had to wait until the Halloween experience was finished, until we could go in and investigate. And I witnessed two teenage girls come out of that experience and it actually urinated themselves. Yeah. So I don't know if that's considered to be a good night out or not. I, I think if you're looking for a haunt, that's the way to do it. And I and I remember them, separ they'll separate you and put you in boxes and do all kinds of things. Do you so. like that? I mean, I can't, as a paranormal <laughs> investigator, I dislike horror films. I don't like haunted house experiences. People think, I would instantly want to like those things, but yep. it couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah. I mean, is this something you enjoy? I uh, I think a fair amount of people find joy in that. I'm I'm on the I'm on the fence. I don't mind a good haunt, uh, but I, I don't like being claustrophobic. I'm more I think I do it more for the art, and I, sure. I think a lot of people probably do it for the art. Which, as an art venue, they they did good work. Yeah, it's, it's good fabulous. Hard. I don't think it's in production anymore, though, sadly. Well, one thing I would add to that is they're creating such negative energy yeah. that any darkness or any entity that wants to feed on that energy is going to hang out in that location and use it as a finger buffet. So in Tibetan culture, there's a thing called a thought form. It's called a tulpa. If enough people are scared and enough people think there's something negative happening there, then by default, something negative will be hanging out there. So anything that's transient, anything that is negative, anything that is dark, will naturally go to the soap factory because it's got all of that energy to feed on. I did an investigation at a place called the London Dungeons, south of London, in Tooley Street, and it's a basically a, a, a scary haunted house, but they're doing the history of torture, for example, and they actually have torture 
in there, you know, all of the equipment, the things they would have used. And it's incredibly haunted, but it only used to be a wine cellar. It's haunted because they're attracting negative energy right. to the location because people are screaming and people are scared. Yeah. Well, there you have it. I think as far as this location, we'll give it a final count, but I, I think we got what we wanted finally. 90% uh, of this well, I, is I was, all... I was bell happy on you this You were very bell yeah. happy. Final tally, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight total for the fiction. And uh, we got two. This is the most the fact. animated you'll ever see me. This is yeah. as animated as an Englishman gets. I'm just as excited as you are. So the, the two we got right, yes, they made soap, soap. <laughs> out of At the soap animal factory. carcasses. And it was a factory. It was a factory. Hurrah. And uh, it was a popular haunt. So we have that. Uh, again, you write about it. Whoa. You write about it in your book, um, as well as many other places. My favorite, Mysterious Minnesota. Uh, you, they can find that. Yep, pretty much everywhere. All good bookshops. If you go to ebooks, if you go to Amazon, you can get that ordered and it's available for you. Come and find me on Amazon. I just want to say thank you for watching us. There'll be an episode again along shortly. And remember, be interested and interesting. Good night. <laughs>